Yeah, well, that's the thing. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm of the same opinion that like, you know, my HDL is high, my triglycerides are low, my LDL is exactly where it's supposed to be because it's healthy. I haven't damaged it. And so whatever it is, it's physiological. And uh, yeah, so yeah, it is nice to see that. It is nice to see, you know, I still get very excited when people send me messages. They, they've lost all this weight. They're, all their markers have improved. Uh, they're off all these medications and all these different things add up. And I'm like, and I know that that would happen because I've seen it so many times before and I understand why it's going to happen. But it's still yeah. very reassuring every time I see it. It's like, oh, thank God. You know? <laughs> and, uh, well, actually, just one point on LDL that we haven't talked about. So we've talked about how, you know, when it's damaged, it becomes harmful. But uh, I just want to talk about the U-shaped curve that mm. exists between cholesterol and all-cause mortality because it's an indisputable fact that people with the very highest levels of cholesterol uh, overall on a, on a popular, large population scale, we're not talking about the LDL studies, just cholesterol full stop, that they tend to have shorter life expectancies. So the question is, so let's break this down a little bit. So first of all, whether or not you derive any benefit from taking a statin with high cholesterol can be predicted by the triglyceride to HDL ratio. So the first thing you should do, well, the first thing I do with my patients, this is not medical advice. The first thing that I do with my patients is have a look at their triglyceride to HDL ratio. And then I use that to inform the discussion I have with them about what likely benefits or side effects of, you know, what's the ratio of that. Um, they're likely to have with taking a statin versus not taking a statin. And if my patients have an excellent triglyceride to HDL ratio, then really there's no reason to subject yourself to the not inconsiderable side effect profile of statins. Now, number two is that a high cholesterol level in and of itself can be a sign of another issue. What do I mean by that? So vitamin B12 deficiency can increase the synthesis of cholesterol. Folate deficiency can increase the synthesis of cholesterol. An inflammatory state, for example, an elevated level of a cytokine called tumor necrosis factor alpha can increase the synthesis of cholesterol. We know that uh, a, a hemochromatosis gene can upset your lipid balance. So what we call the HFE1 gene, a hemochromatosis carrier state or hemochromatosis itself as a, as a disease, uh, an oxidation state. There's multiple reasons why your cholesterol might be high. So we're not saying if you have a high cholesterol, you can ignore it if your triglyceride to HDL ratio is good. What we're saying is that there's no evidence that you'll get a benefit from a statin, but you still probably should have some visibility that if your cholesterol is tripled, that there may be something else going on. And if I know I'm going to beat the same old drum again, but dairy and other foods that trigger autoimmune reactions that are commonly consumed on those kind of diets. So I said tumor necrosis factor alpha or B12 deficiency. If you're getting gut inflammation, that might impair your ability to absorb B12, for example. So you need to have visibility that there might be something else that with a more nuanced understanding of actually what leads the body to synthesize lipoproteins, you can actually dig down a little bit deeper and hopefully get to the root root of the problem. Yeah. And, and speaking of which, you're talking about cholesterol and heart disease and everything like that. Um, there was one of the talks you gave um, at the conference in Gold Coast recently, talking about sort of like a, uh, more to do with uh, cardiovascular disease being uh stimulated by, by coagulation, in fact, and not necessarily, um, you know, by the, the, uh, yeah. the same sort of models that we are before. Can you, can you tell us a bit about that? Right. So I'm going to have to give a shout out to um, Malcolm Kendrick, David Diamond. There's a couple of other thought leaders here who have really been focused on atherosclerosis. So when we talk about atherosclerosis, so you've got the artery, you've got the lumen of the artery. Now in the lumen of the artery, you've got these little fatty deposits that line it. And we're basically taught that those fatty deposits are cholesterol. Well, no. So they're actually, um, they contain things that look like cholesterol crystals within them. So we just assume that the LDL particles get deposited into the lining of the, the blood vessel and it just builds up and leads to a fatty lump and nothing could be further from the truth. In actual fact, 
and I won't go through all the details now because it's probably about a 15 minute explanation in and of itself. I've got a lecture coming out shortly on this topic. In actual fact, it looks like these, these uh, fatty deposits are actually made of old blood clots. So basically, if you damage, if you were to scratch the inside of a blood vessel, then you'd form a blood clot. And over time, that blood clot would mature. And that blood clot essentially, so would have a lot of red blood cells in it. That's what blood clots are. Red blood cells contain a lot of cholesterol, a lot of lipids, and there's a, a, a bunch of other things in them. So it actually looks like uh, the, there's, you know, if you've got a pro-clotting tendency, then that increases your risk of heart disease. Now, interestingly, we talk about the triglyceride to HDL ratio being a very important factor to predict your risk of having a sudden blockage of an artery. So sudden blockages of arteries happen with a blood clot, not the fatty deposits. If you get a fatty deposit, gradually your body will build a detour, a bypass, and that, that will actually, what we call a collateral circulation. And in actual fact, if you just have a fatty deposits that build that, you know, that end up narrowing your arteries over time, then you'll probably end up with bypass or collateral circulation, and it can often have a 100% blockage without having too many side effects. But if you go from a very open artery to suddenly occluding because of a blood clot, then that's what we call a heart attack. And this tendency to form clots correlates very strongly to the triglyceride to HDL ratio. And I talk about this a lot in the lecture. So this brings the whole model back together. So like you were saying before about how you like to try and, uh, you know, look for holes in your theory. So when I was looking at this clotting theory, I said, well, we've got very strong data on the triglyceride to HDL. So if this clotting theory is true, then it must also relate back to triglycerides and HDL. And it does. They're absolutely in lock step. So this then comes back to the fact of, well, if it's these sudden clots forming in the blood vessels that block them off and cause heart attacks and they end up forming these fatty deposits, then what factors lead to, you know, excessive coagulation tendency? Uh, so things like diabetes, excess blood sugar, things like oxidative stress, things like inhaling pollution because these pollution molecules go through, uh, get absorbed into your, your circulation. So this is all, every, all the cardiovascular risk factors that we understand, the classical ones, they absolutely are consistent and explanatory with regards to this clotting model of heart disease. So uh, it, it's just a different way of thinking about it. Now, it doesn't mean we have to necessarily do a lot that's different. And that's the beauty of our understanding of, you know, we've already understood that oxidation is something that's bad and we know that breathing and pollution, that smoking is bad and so on and so forth. It does provide us with a couple of other nuances. So if we accept, for example, that oxidation um, is a key trigger, then perhaps given that, you know, we live in polluted cities, we, we can't avoid the oxidative stress that comes from inhaling pollutants, maybe we can take some antioxidant supplements. You know, there's some potent antioxidant supplements out there. You've got N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, coenzyme Q10, selenium, melatonin. Pe most people think of melatonin as a sleep aid. That, that's rubbish. In actual fact, nocturnal animals secrete melatonin before they wake up. So it doesn't really make sense that it would have exact opposite effects in different species. In actual fact, it's a potent mitochondrial antioxidant. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, the, it does afford us these other opportunities. And we know that then maybe uh, consuming olive oil, which everybody thinks, oh, olive oil is wonderful. Well, that's still got a bit of oxidation potential. So if we're trying to reduce our overall oxidation load, you know, maybe even things like olive oil wouldn't be recommended besides the fact that they also contain fake plant cholesterol. So it's a really interesting model. It, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. And it really reinforces the point that we shouldn't have blood sugar levels that are going up and down like a roller coaster. We shouldn't be consuming oxidized foods and we should try and do things that lower our oxidation stress. Yeah. Well, I think that's the thing is that, uh, you know, we have, we've had such a poor understanding of it to begin with, you know, none of our models have really explained things properly though. 
you know, uh, um, you know, lipid uh, model of heart disease that you know, certainly didn't pan out from my from my point of view. And so it's it's very you know it's it's uh, important that we look at other alternatives. That's that's uh, very interesting that that's come out. 